series is called Coming Home, and we've taken that title from the story, the parable that Jesus told, called the parable of the prodigal son. And it's a, it's a parable, it's a story that Jesus told about two sons. Uh, a father had two sons, and the younger son is labeled as the prodigal son. He took from his father an early inheritance, and then he left. He went to a distant country, squandered his money, lost it, spent it on wild living. Uh, then at some point, he found himself in a desperate situation, and he returned to his father uh, after he had humiliated his father, after he had turned his back on his father. Uh, the story says that the father embraced him, and there was an amazing moment of God's grace and forgiveness that's poured out on this prodigal son. So today my, my sermon is going to come from the part of the story, though, where the son realizes that he has sinned. He realizes he has failed in his, uh, his walk with his father, his failure, and he realizes it and goes back to the father. And so my sermon title today is How to Fix Our Failures. How to Fix Our Failures. Uh, just real quick, has anyone ever failed? Uh, now, I don't, mean like, I don't mean like you studied hard and you still messed up your test. I mean like moral failure, uh, maybe you've sinned in some way, you've, you've done, a couple, if you raise your hand, because right, you're lying if your hand isn't up, that's your failure right now. We can just settle it right now. You are on this board with us. We're all in. We all are a mess in some way, and um, so we need to know how to fix our failures and I'm going to just let you know that I think today's message is one of the most important messages I'm going to share all year long. Uh, I really want you to lean into this today. I want you to get something to write with. Uh, I want you to take a few notes on today because uh, we need to know how to restore our relationship with the Father. Uh, because we are imperfect people and we live in an imperfect world and we're going to have moments where we do things that we look back and go, how did I do this? Why did I do this? And, and regardless of why, we need to know how to restore our relationship with the Father, and we need to know how to restore our relationship with those we hurt in the process. And so it's really important. I really don't think that enough of us understand what to do when we mess up. And as a result of not knowing how to fix it, uh, we don't know how to restore our relationship with God. And and what happens when we don't know how to restore our relationship with God, we end up like hiding our sin and we withdraw from God, we withdraw from others, and it's just a really unhealthy place we live in our lives because we kind of stuff that, that sin inside because we don't know how to fix it. We don't know how to fix our hearts. We don't know how to fix our relationships. We don't know how to fix our, our walk with God. And if you don't fix your relationship with God, then your heart for God will grow cold. If you don't fix your relationship with, with, this, with the Lord and with others, if we don't heal our hearts, then we're doomed to just repeat these problems and we'll take it into the next relationship and we'll just carry it on and on. So we've got to know how to fix our failures. And so today I want to just share with us about how to fix the failures from the story of the prodigal son. I want to start with some prayer just to open our hearts up. And if you would just for this moment... Uh, you can take your pen and set it down. I, I want you to just to pause for a moment and let, let me just pray for you that you'd receive this today. So, Father, we come to you knowing that we have all messed up and we have all blown it. Uh, none of us are perfect, and so we're all part of this message today. But, Lord, the significance of us knowing how to restore is so important. It's vital to our walk with you. It's vital to our relationships around us. And so, Father, I pray that you'd use the words that I share today to be your words. And so, Father, I pray that we would hear it and we would apply it. And, Lord, you'd use it to change our lives in a way that gives us great health for the future in our spirit life and with others. We pray this today in the name of Jesus. Would you say amen? Amen. amen. So, the prodigal son, as Jesus told it in Luke chapter 15, verse 11, it says, Then Jesus said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there he wasted his possessions with prodigal living. 
Now, most of the time when we think of the word prodigal, we think of a wayward son. We think of someone that has walked away, and that's not a bad definition. It's not the exact definition that is in Scripture. A prodigal actually means extravagant and wasteful all at the same time. It's an extravagance of wastefulness. And so this younger son, the prodigal son, as we're learning, he was extravagant in his wastefulness. He took his father's inheritance he went to a, a far country. I, I picture it like this, him showing up in some little town, uh, showing up in the first saloon that he finds, a bar, and kind of announcing to everyone, hey, guess what, everybody? I'm loaded. I got a lot of money. Drinks are on me all week long, and we're just going to have a party here. Um, in their drunken stupor, he is buying prostitutes, and he is wasting his money on wild living. Uh, be honest, when it talks about this prodigal sin, what it's saying is, is he's really extravagant in his sin. He's a really good sinner. Um, he is good at it, and he is wasting what his father had given him. He's wasting all the opportunities in front of him in his life, and he is just, he's just, just blowing his money like crazy. It was fun for a season for him, probably, but with all sin, it has a season that seems pleasurable, but it always comes to an end and causes significant problems and pain in our life. The Bible says in James 1.15 about sin, it says when sin is allowed to grow, in other words, when we don't know how to fix the problem of sin in our life, when we don't know how to repent, we don't know how to, to deal with these things, if we allow that sin to grow, it gives birth to death. When we don't fix our failures, sin will kill your soul. It will just it will eat you from the inside out. It becomes a condemnation that we don't know how to get over. If we don't know how to deal with our sin in our life, then it can ruin our marriages. It can it can get you fired from a job if you don't know what to do with this stuff. Sin will eat you up. Unrepented sin becomes a cancer to your soul. It'll condemn you from the inside out. And so this prodigal son, he had spent everything. It says in verse 14 that when he had spent it all, all of it, and he had a lot, he wasted a lot, he was great at spending. But when he had spent it all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. You see, sinful living always creates a wasteland in your life. And he had spent it all, and now there was a wasteland. And just taking it from how do I apply that, you need to know that when we live with unrepented, undealt with, unfixed sin and problems in our life, it creates a, a, you know, a wasteland from within. And so it's speaking of that, but in the story, the son has now fallen on severe hard times, and he was out of money. He was in a distant land from his family. Uh, the famine had hit, and he was desperate, and he was suffering. So therefore, in verse 15, it says, Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. In other words, he went and got a job. So he went and joined himself to a country, or to a citizen of that country, and then he sent him into the fields to feed the swine. So he got a J-O-B, not a bad idea. When things go rough, you go get a job. And so he went and got a job. His job was feeding pigs. Now, it sounds pretty good on the surface that he got a job, but here's the real problem with it. He was destitute. He was homeless. He was hopeless. His life was in ruins from all of his actions, yet he still wasn't ready to go home to his father. Because going home to his father meant that he would have to accept responsibilities for his actions. Going home to his father would mean that I have to own my problems. I have to own my sin. And so rather than going and submitting to his father, he said, I'll continue to try to do this on my own. I'll continue to try to take care of myself. Instead of owning it and going to his father and saying, I need help, he decided, I'll just get a job and I'll just try to do it on my own and I'll just, I'll just keep working at it I'm not going to accept help. I'm not going to go to anyone else. Because going to his father would have meant he had had to own his actions. He wasn't finished with his rebellious, independent spirit in his life. I want to do it myself. I can handle it myself. Instead of owning it and fixing it, returning to his father, he chose to stay away. You know, that's what a lot of folks do. When we have this 
independent nature inside of us, if we have an independent spirit inside of us, we separate ourselves. People separate themselves from people who represent spiritual oversight to them. Just like this younger son, he didn't want to go to his father. He didn't want to have to go to him and say, gosh, I blew it. He, he stayed independent. He stayed away. He stayed out. He stayed away from those that could help him. A person who desires to restore the relationships and their integrity will walk in humility. But a person with a rebellious independent spirit acts out of pride. And that's what this young son was doing. He was acting out of pride. He's like, I can do it. I can take care of myself. I can fix this. I don't need anyone else. I'm not going to anyone else. I'm doing it myself. I'll just get this job. But unfortunately, all this kind of rebellion always leads people further down a road of more pain. And that's what happens to this younger son in verse 16. He has now got a job feeding the pigs. And in verse 16, it says, He would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. Here he is, destitute, hungry, helpless, hopeless, feeding the pigs, and he's looking at what he's feeding the pigs. And typically pigs just eat waste, not like real good food. And he's looking at that and going, that looks better than what I have. He had hit rock bottom in his life. He, he was feeding pigs. It wasn't a job that even paid enough for him to eat. And for the prodigal son who was born under the law of Moses, pigs were considered ceremonially unclean animals. And so now he is, as a Jewish boy, um, not only feeding the pigs, living with the pigs, he is wanting what they want he is wanting what they eat. He was in the worst of places, the worst of circumstances, that so much so that he was so hungry, he wanted to eat what the pigs were eating. Hey, just one quick lesson we can all learn about sin in our life, and we can learn it from the prodigal son, is that all sin and failure brings wreckage into our lives if we don't know how to fix it. So finally, the prodigal son makes a smart move. In Luke chapter 15, verse 17, it says, But when he came to himself, when he came to himself, when he realized what was happening, when he saw his sin, he came to himself. It says, He said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? He said, I will arise. I will go to my father I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and he came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran out and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. This portion of text we're going to dig for a few minutes to find out how we fix our failures. And the first thing that the prodigal son did to fix his failure is he grieved. He grieved. Taking notes, write grieve down. You see, it said the prodigal son came to himself. He processed his past actions. He began to see his wrong. He began to own his sin. He began to soul search a little bit. He began to dig inside some and go, how did I get here? What happened to me? He began to look at how he'd failed his father and how he'd broken those relationships. He began to, to process what was going on inside of him. In order to fix our failures, we must grieve. You must grieve the failure. You must feel it. You must soul search it. You don't justify failures. You don't minimize the failures. You don't rationalize your failures. You don't make excuses for your failures. You don't brush it off. You don't play it down. You don't rush through it. You don't ignore your failures. You feel them. You feel the pain. You feel it. Listen, if, if you have a genuine relationship with your Heavenly Father, your failure is going to bother you. It's going to, listen, it doesn't, and this isn't conviction from the Holy Spirit. This isn't condemnation. This is, I love you, Father, and I have done something that has been against something that pleases you, and that bothers me. It ought to bother us 
when we fail our Father. It should cause us to, to feel something. There should be a godly sorrow from our failures. Without sorrow, we cheapen God's grace towards us. Without sorrow, we cheapen the grace. Yes, you need to know that God has already forgiven you, but without sorrow, you don't appreciate the depth of grace that's given to you. If you just brush over it all the time, you go, well, uh, you know, God forgives me and I'm just moving on. Listen, you're cheapening what he did. You're not appreciating the depths of what you have done and the grace that he has poured into your life. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 17, it says, Godly sorrow brings repentance. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regrets. Worldly sorrow brings death. Godly sorrow. Now, I'm not talking about condemnation. I'm not talking about beating yourself up over and over and over. But sorrow that brings us to, to a place of humility before our Father, that, that produces healing within our soul. There's a moment that we need to come to God and go, Oh my gosh, I blew it. So sorry, Father. No one likes to feel bad. And I hate it when other people feel bad. My personality type is, is I panic when someone feels bad and I try to fix it for them. But if you fix it for them, they don't have an opportunity to grieve it out and find out what's going on inside of them. They're not digging it out. If you just go around, what happens is, is when you fix it for people before they've grieved it, you're enabling them to continue to walk in that problem over and over. No one likes to grieve. But it is the way we learn. It is the way we discover our hearts, our motivations, and we learn from our failures this way. Too often we, we push our pain down. Uh, we, we take that, that sin, whatever we did, and rather than, than get it out to the Lord and to pour our hearts out before God, rather than take that time and the effort and the energy and, and, and what it takes to pull close to God, rather than do that, we tend to just push it down and cover it up and when we do that, it's like we're a Coke bottle that's sh been shaken. And then somebody's going to come along and open that top one day and you explode because you didn't repent of it. You didn't deal with it. You didn't grieve it. You didn't process it. You didn't go inside and go, well, how did I get here? What did I do? This younger son, it says that he came to his senses. He began to see his wrong. He began to understand, I have messed it up here. The book of Matthew, it shows us a quick glimpse of Peter who had failed by denying Jesus in public. Now, Peter had spent three years with Jesus and seen his miracles. And, and so he has this epic failure where he denies Jesus. And the Bible says that in verse Matthew 26, 75, it says, And Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. He remembered. In other words, he came to his senses. And it says, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And his response is beautiful. He went outside and he wept bitterly. In other words, he owned his failure. He's like, I blew it. And it humbled him. He was disappointed in himself. He regretted his actions of what he had done. He had wept it out. He, he felt it. I believe God wants us to be really honest with Him when we fail. I believe God wants us to draw close to Him. I believe God wants us to, to grieve our, our moments. Without it, we, we just brush by it. When David in the Old Testament had committed adultery, he wrote this in Psalm 51, verse 17. He says, My sacrifice, O God, and this is David. His sacrifice is a broken spirit and a broken and contrite, contrite heart. In other words, he humbled himself before the Lord. There was a place in his heart that was broken because he had, he had failed so bad. He was like, God, I blew it. I messed up, God. David had a humble and repentive heart. And that's what God wants from us. He doesn't want you to beat yourself up, but he wants you to get honest and say, God, I blew it. It will take longer in the grieving process for the larger failures in our life. So somewhat of the degree that you have blown it 
you know, some failures are more epic than others. And it may take longer for some. But I found that the more sensitive my heart is to God, the more I, I love Him, the more I appreciate His grace, that even the small things that I do that, that are disappointing in my actions and my, my way I handle my life, even the small things deserve a season of me going, why did I do that? What happened? I'm sorry, Lord. Every action, not out of self-punishment, but just from a broken heart of a realization that I'm, I, I have a nature that can sin. Just a realization that I, I, I blew that one. All of it deserves a moment. And I want you to know that a sin, when we do blow it in some way, the enemy always steps in to participate. Because that sin just gives a, a little doorway, a little gateway for him to participate in your, your pain. And the first thing the enemy always does is he minimizes what you did. The first thing he'll do is he'll go, oh, it wasn't a big deal. Brush it under. He'll, he'll just, that, usually that's his first response. He minimizes it so that you won't deal with it. So you'll go, oh, it's not a big deal. Nobody knew. Just, nope. Just, he minimizes it. He minimizes it so that we won't grieve it, so that we'll ignore it, so we'll brush by it. But once we get past it just a little bit, instead of minimizing it, he maximizes it. Then he says, you're the worst person ever. I can't believe you didn't deal with that. I can't believe you didn't grieve that. I can't believe you didn't fix that. He's like, your failure is forever. And he will pour that guilt and condemnation on you. But what grieving does is grieving brings God's grace and his mercy into our life to fully heal us. It's the healing that we're looking for. We want to get deep inside. We want to become different on the inside. When you're healed and then the enemy comes to remind you of what you've done, it's really great. This is one of the best moments you get to have in life because we're going to blow it. And the enemy's going to come at you and go, oh, man, you blew it. You're the worst ever. And he begins to bring up your past. Then all you have to say is him is, yep, that's true. That happened. I blew it. But I grieved it. And I thank God for his mercy who has healed me. Now I praise God for my victory over it. I'm no longer that person who does those things. I'm healed. I'm free. I'm a trophy of God's grace. I praise God when I look at my mistake because his... Grace is greater than anything I've ever done. And so instead of, listen, instead of going into depression when the enemy says, you're awful, you say, oh, that reminds me of how good God is. And then you begin to praise God. And the enemy will stop reminding of your past if you turn it into praise. If you say, God, thank you that you saved me, you healed me, I'm not that person anymore. And the enemy gets tired of that because he doesn't want you to praise God. So every time now that you've been healed and you've grieved it, you've processed it out, you've learned from it, now when he brings it up, you go, hey, thank you, I'll just remember to praise my God. Amen? So the first thing we do is we grieve our failures. How do we do that? We own it. We bring a humble heart to God. We learn from it. That's enough to change it. Right there. I could end the sermon right there and you'd have enough to work with. But that doesn't complete the restoration process. That doesn't finish the story. Next, the prodigal son, after he came to himself, it says he arose and left his pig pen and went to his father. If you're writing this down, which you should be today, the next word to write down is change. He left his pig pen. The prodigal son changed his location. He changed his job. He changed his environment. He literally had to arise from what he was doing, where he was. He had to get out of the environment that he was in so that he could become the person that God had called him to be. I've heard it said... The change isn't change until you've changed. He can talk about how he wants forgiveness. He can talk about how he's a different person. But if you're in the mud pit, you're still muddy. If you're hanging out with the pigs, listen, you can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. So what you have to do when you come to your senses and you realize you have blown it, 
then change has to come. You have to change your environment. You have to start doing something different in your life. The deal is, is most of us are not strong enough to remain in an unhealthy environment and still find the healing we desire. When I was in college, I put myself in an environment of partying and drugs and alcohol. The environment shaped my actions because I wasn't strong enough to put myself in an environment like that. And I found myself living in a way that was totally contrary to what my God wanted me to, to do and the way I was raised. And I found myself in those actions of my environment. It pulled me into sin. I became like that what I was around. And when I came to my senses one day when I was in college, I left college. I had to get up and leave that environment. I had to place myself in a new place, a place where people would support me, direct me to God, people that would pray for me and lift me up. I had to leave my environment. I had to change. That even means I had to change some of my buddies for a season. I loved my friends, and honestly, I still have great friendships with them. We still talk and, and carry on, and we laugh about our past, but inside, I'm kind of like, I know, but I blew it. Sometimes we have to change our environments. I had to change my college. I wanted freedom enough to change. If you want to fix your failures, then you'll have to change. What will you have to change? You'll have to change some patterns in your life. You'll have to change some habits in your life, and you'll have to change the environments that you're in. Because if you keep doing what you've been doing, you'll keep getting what you've been getting. Change. Everybody say change. Change is setting a new course direction. You're not fixing your failure if you stay in the mud pit. Amen? So you have to change. He came to his senses. He grieved it. Father, I'm so sorry. Father, I've blown it. I'm humble before you. And now, God, I'm changing. I'm doing something different. And the third step of finding your freedom to fixing your failure is confess. The prodigal son not only sinned against God, but he also against his father and his family. The story said that he arose and he went to his father and he confessed by saying, I have sinned against heaven and you. I've sinned against you, heaven and you. Uh, typically, our failures impact more than just ourselves. Typically, when we mess it up and we fail, we blow it, there's usually some sort of, you know, um, damage that's done around us and the people in our lives. And the way we fix our failures is we confess our wrongs to those we've hurt. In order to fix our failures, we need to fix our relationships. The Bible says in James 5, 16, it says, Confess your sins to each other, and then pray for each other that you may be healed. There's some connection between our relationship with God and our relationship with others. And if we don't fix our relationship here, God will keep reminding you of that until you do. And that's why it says you, you go to those, you confess your sins to each other. Now, we don't heal each other. I mean, you can come tell me all your problems, and I, I can't heal your heart. But what it does is it begins to heal a relationship, and then we pray for each other, and then God begins to heal our soul from that. And so we have to go to one another. If you've hurt someone, if you've wronged someone, if you've done something that impacts someone, the, the thing to do is to go to them and just say, I'm so sorry. You say, will you please forgive me for what I did? Like it seems so basic and so simple, but we skip it so much. Why? Because we don't want to uncover ourselves. Will you forgive me? You look at someone and say, I realize this hurts you. I want to restore my relationship with you. Healing begins here. I can't promise you you'll fix the relationship, but you can do your part from your side. I don't know what damage you've done. I don't know what damage I've done. But this is where you begin to heal your own soul here. So many times people run away from the people they hurt rather than going to humbly apologize. A simple, I'm so sorry, can go a long way. But let's be honest. It's hard to confess to one another. It's hard to do. 
it's hard to go to someone and say, I blew it. It's hard to uncover ourselves. It's, it's a vulnerable place. Like, you're vulnerable when you do that. You're, you're pretty, you know, like, I'm revealing to you my, my weakness today. It's just a vulnerable place. And when we confess our failures, we're, we're also committing that we're going to get better in this area. And you need to know that. That's why I'm sitting here with you today. I want to get better. It's a big deal. But it's the right way to fix your failures. We humbly confess our failures to those we hurt. They say this with me. Four words. Will you forgive me? One, two, three. Will you forgive me? That'll go a long way. I wonder how many relationships could have been restored if we'd just gone humbly and vulnerably to people and say, gosh, I believe that. So far, three steps. We realize our failures. We come to our senses. We humbly present ourselves before the Lord. We, we change. We head in a different direction. We change our environments. And then we go to those we've hurt. And the last part today is we receive. We receive forgiveness. We receive it. The father in this story is the hero of the story. And he, he represents God in this story. And when the prodigal son was still a long way off from, the, from his father, the father was positioned waiting on him to come. He was waiting for him. And he had compassion. He looked out. He saw his son coming. And, and he went to his son. He ran and he embraced him and he kissed him. I just the moment just is so the, the gravity of this moment is this son who is who has blown it, who has wasted everything, who has who has caused his father great embarrassment, is now approaching, he's coming, and then his father is coming to him. And and what, what the picture of it is is this son, he actually goes to his knees in front of his father and just falls into his arms and falls at his feet, and the father is just standing there and he's embracing him and he's going, I love you. You're forgiven. What the son did is he, he dropped all of that pain at the feet of Jesus. And he received that forgiveness that's there. The Bible says that in 1 Peter 5, 6, that humble ourselves under God's mighty hand. And then he will lift you up in due time. But look, it says in verse 7, cast your anxiety. In other words, cast the condemnation. Cast all the guilt on him. Why? Because he cares for you. That casting, uh, if you're a fisherman, you might think of casting, you know, like this. That, that's not what it's talking about. It's not like throwing it like that. Casting in this is to, means to literally just drop it. Condemnation, drop it. Guilt, drop it. Shame, drop it. There's only one place you can drop your shame, and only one place, place you can drop your condemnation, and that's at the feet of Jesus. But when you go to Jesus and you say, I blew it, I've processed this out, he's like, I forgave you before you ever started your journey home. He's like, I was standing on the porch in a place of forgiveness, just waiting. You need to know that your forgiveness is already dealt with at the cross. He's standing, waiting. And if you'll come to Him and just drop it at His feet, cast those anxieties, cast that guilt, cast that shame, He wants you to walk in that not another day. And you receive your total forgiveness. You're 100% forgiven and loved by God. That's the story of the prodigal son, how he returned to his father. That's how he fixed his failure. God wants us all to fix our failures. Because when we do, we restore with the Father. And that's what we want. We want a life that's authentic before God. You know what happens if you don't fix your failures through grieving and you don't heal from the inside? You begin to approach God as a way of religion instead of a way of relationship. And you start just going through the motions. You go, well... Uh, I know that I failed and I haven't dealt with that, so, but I still know I need to go to church. 
And so people show up in church and they stand there and worship. And what's going on is inside they're feeling guilt, but they haven't dealt with it. And so they still go through the motions. And so then it becomes lifeless. And then your walk with God gets cold. And then you start going, well, this doesn't work for me. And then you fall away from God. You fall away from church. And you start going, well, it just didn't work for me. The reason it didn't work for you is because you didn't work for the problem. you got to go and say, God, I blew it. I love you. And that's the heart of the prodigal son story today. Amen? God's asking you to come home. I don't know where you are today, but I want to pray for you to come home. Come home to the Father. He is standing on His front porch looking for us, knowing that we have blown it, and He wants to forgive you. But I want to encourage you of the process to get there. Don't skip one, two, and three. He's going to forgive you now, but you still need to do one, two, and three. Grieve it. Change. Fix your relationships. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. God, my desire from this message, Lord, is that we would have authentic relationship with you. That we wouldn't just blow past our failures. But God, we would would come to our senses, that we would realize, oh, I failed the one who has saved me, and I've, I've blown it. I'm so thankful, Lord, that you're not condemning us, but on the other hand, I don't want to not appreciate your grace. And so, God, I pray that we would just say, God, for every place we've blown it today, I, I just ask you to forgive me. But I wonder if there's some people here today, as I stand here, who are in a place of, of, of failure, a place of sin. And, and there's a moment today that when I was talking that maybe one or more of these steps has been skipped. And, and I just want you to make a commitment in your own heart that you will go through this process so that you can have an authentic relationship with God and with others around you. And so, Father, I pray that today in Jesus' name. And with every head bowed, I pray that there are people here that have never begun a relationship with the Father, that this morning that we would say, yes, I want forgiveness of the Father. I want to come home for the first time. The Father's waiting for you. If you've never begun a relationship with the Father, this is your opportunity. In just a moment, I'm going to say a prayer and invite you to say this prayer with me. And this would be you saying, I want to have all my sins forgiven and have a relationship with the Father, with God today. And the way we have that relationship is that Jesus, He died for our sins on our behalf so we can be totally forgiven. I wonder if there's anybody here today who said, Pastor, Pastor Tim, today I want to begin a relationship with God. Is there anybody here who raise your hand to me and said, Pastor, today I want to begin a relationship with God. God bless you. I see you. Anybody else? I wonder if there's people here today that would raise your hand and say, I've had a relationship with God, but over the last season of my life, I just haven't been close to God, and I want to draw close to God. I want to come home. Is there anybody here that say, that's me today? I, I, I know I've been saved, but I'm further than I want to be. Yeah, I see all those hands. The hands begin. Are you here today? And Maybe some of you are like, I know that I've sinned against God, and, and I want to begin that process of total restoration. Are the people here today that would say, I, I'm there that really spoke to me. Would you raise your hand? So many hands. Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name for every hand that's up. If you'd meet those needs. Would all of you repeat this with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. He came to earth. He died for my sins so that I may be forgiven. I thank you for grace. And as of today, I am saved saved from the penalty of my sin and I have a new relationship with God in Jesus name come on everybody say amen amen God bless you church